What's good y'all, welcome back. It feels so weird having to say my intro knowing that I'm recording this all the way through, but I hope you guys have been enjoying the reactions. I've been enjoying the documentary myself and I'm ready for it to get even more crazier than it already has. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying it though. Original video link will be down in the description. Let's get into the video. PM during practice for the Bush 200, Adam Petty's car goes straight at the entrance of turn 3 and smashes into the wall nearly head on. There is no footage of the accident, but eyewitnesses say the car briefly catches fire as it grinds to a stop against the outside wall. That sounds fucking horrible. As the Petty team prepares the backup, emergency crews begin to cut the frame of the primary. Petty is removed and transported by ambulance to a helicopter pad outside the track where an airlift awaits. By the time Petty arrives at Concord Hospital, he is pronounced dead. The cause of death is originally listed as serious head injuries, but it is later clarified as a closed head injury at the base of the skull, also mm. known as a basilar skull fracture. The number 45 car is covered in a tarp, then removed from the track. While it's never officially confirmed what happened to the car, it's believed to have been buried. The team withdraws, the future of both team and family very much in doubt. Well, today's show was meant to be a celebration of Adam Petty's life. He was certainly just a fine young individual. Just a prince of a guy. He came from one of the finest families that you'll ever want to meet. And our prayers and best wishes continue to go out to the entire Petty family. You know, this is a very dark time, but I know what I'm going to do when I think of Adam Petty. I'm going to remember that smile. And I encourage fans to do the same thing. Remember the smile, then it won't be so bad. Very good point, Steve. Remember the Petty smile. The Samba race is won by Tim Fidoa. Interestingly, this is the only Bush Series race of the first 13 where Irwin's number 42 is not entered. Roper fails to qualify. The following Monday at 11 a.m., services are held for Adam in High Point. Among the drivers who attend are Ward Burton, Bill Elliott, Ernie Irvin, Dale Jarrett, Bobby and Terry Labonte, and Bobby Allison. A few years earlier, Allison had separated from his wife, Judy, after the deaths of their sons, Davey and Clifford Allison, both rising stars in NASCAR. Davey's final start came in the inaugural race at New Hampshire in 1993. Clifford's passing, which happened following a crash in a Bush Series practice session at Michigan in 1992, was the most recent death in the series before Adam. The couple reunites. I'm sorry if you guys can hear my fucking family. dog coughing. Later that summer, will remarry at Bessemer, Alabama. On May 17th, five days after Adam's death, Kyle Petty says he won't run the Winston Open at Charlotte, where a four-by-six-foot flag bearing Adam's name will fly over Victory Lane. Four days later, Adam's Bush Series team is also withdrawn from the next race in Charlotte on May 27th. Kyle won't run that weekend either, and the team has put Steve Grissom, the team's truck series driver, into the number 44 Hot Wheels Pontiac. Grissom will fail to qualify, joining a list of five DNQs. On May 20th, Lyndon Amick carries a petty blue decal on his hood for the ARCA race at Charlotte. By race's end, Adams number 45 rolls into victory lane for a second time. Corner. No, not going to happen. Lyndon Amick will win his first career ARCA victory with Kerry Earnhardt and the veteran Tim Steele in tow. Lyndon Amick led the final 19 laps of the event, scores the victory. There you see him driving by what's left of the Shauna Robinson car after she was involved in an accident in turn one in the last lap scramble to the finish. But it is Lyndon Amick from South Carolina in the Ken Schrader Racing entry here. He has scored the victory, his first in the ARCA series. He's a happy young man wearing an Adam Petty hat tonight. There he is. Lyndon, your car owner, Kenny Schrader, was not very encouraging on the radio. He said you had better cars behind you. Did you think you could hold those guys off? Well, I knew if I just hold my head and uh, I tell you, run this race like Adam did two years ago. Uh, he won this deal, man, and we're carrying his name on the hood. This means the world to me, and this is for the Petty family and for Kyle. And we love them to death. And, you know, our hearts are with them, but I'm with them all week, and that's why I want to do this. It was my idea to put this guy on the hood, and uh, he was with me tonight. It's against this backdrop that Kenny Irwin Jr. competes in his second that round of the All-Star race. As in 1998, Irwin advances to the main event by being the new driver of a team that won the previous season. Sponsor Bell South celebrates their first start in the All-Star race with a special paint scheme for Project Impact, a disaster readiness program in collaboration with FEMA. The race gets off to a bad start when Irwin breaks loose in turn three, putting John Andretti into oh. the outside wall. Irwin finishes 12th, one lap down to Dale Jr. 
Despite the struggles, for Irwin, it's a welcome distraction from the persistent rumors about Chip Ganassi investing in Team Sabco, and now new rumors about switching to Dodge, rumors that don't include Irwin or his teammate Sterling Marlin staying with the team. Then, after the race, a concrete walkway leaving the Charlotte track collapses. 78 fans are injured, 13 of them critically. Fortunately, none are killed. One week later, Irwin makes what will turn out to be his 14th and final Bush Series start. He finishes 20th, then runs 24th in the Coca-Cola 600. Across the garage, Tony Roper is frustrated. Contrary to what he was promised, the Washington Irving team's cars are old and slow, accounting for his several DNQs. In qualifying for the Bush race, Roper is swapped out of the number 50 for Stanton Barrett, but Barrett also fails to qualify. The team insists this is only a temporary change, and that Roper will be back behind the wheel at Dover. That changes on June 1st, as the Dr. Pepper team isn't entered at the Monster Mile. One driver who is entered is Kyle Petty, who to Richard's surprise will not only run the cup race, but drive Adam's car on Saturday. The moment overwhelms Kyle in his first public appearance since the accident. You know, coming in here last night and just rolling through the front gate of the racetrack and knowing that, that Adam went here was... Uh, pretty hard. I don't think the emotion of getting back in the car um, and getting in his car is going to be that bad because I've been around his crew every day. I've been around that car every day. Uh, I think it was just coming back to the racetrack and seeing new people and being around that part of it. That, that was, that's the toughest part. We used to joke about being father and son and best friend, but it was, it was a lot truer than I, I think we are. We were. And I, I think Austin and I, and Montgomery Lee and Patty and all of us are in the same way. So um, I think that was, I don't know, it, we just, we tried to do that because we felt like that was more important than the race and stuff. Racing's important, but that was, your family was a lot more important. Kyle qualifies for the Bush race and runs as high as sixth before a late pit stop drops him to 26th. Kyle misses the field for the cup race, but serves as a relief driver for teammate John Andretti, who is struggling with rib injuries from his tangle with Irwin in the Winston. He does all this at Dover, site of Kyle's last cup victory and Adam's first laps led in the series. Irwin finishes 17th at Dover after qualifying 11th, and at one point nudges Jimmy Spencer out of the way. June 11th, Michigan. Kyle Petty gets his number 44 into a cup race for the first time since Richmond, but a blown engine leaves him 39th. Irwin doesn't finish much better in 35th. In the next round at Pocono, Kyle's engine lets go again, putting him 41st. Irwin what is up with his cars? The series then heads west to Sears Point, where Kyle Petty makes a statement in qualifying. He puts his car on the outside pole, his first front row start since April 1996 at Martinsville. Kyle Petty knows that a win today won't change history, and it certainly won't turn back the clock. But it might be the first time... Or just these cars in general. I feel like something is always happening to them. Were the cars back then not as reliable? Like parts wise, not safety wise. On June 23rd, 2000, the same day I take this picture of Irwin's car on the front stretch. That night in the Arca race at Toledo, Scott Baker is killed in this. Oh my! When his car strikes a protective tire barrier. In Sunday's cup race on the road course, Petty finishes 19th. Irwin sees how do, Elliot Sadler in the wall, then spins out. Wait, the how does he? Wait, 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 wait. How did he just speed past that so fast? He just, he just ran past that. The same day I take this picture of Irwin's car on the front stretch. That night in the Arca race at Toledo, Scott Baker is killed in this accident when his car wow. strikes a protective tire barrier. In Sunday's cup race on the road course, Petty finishes 19th. Irwin squeezes Elliott Sadler in the wall, then spins out in the final laps and finishes 25th. Four days after Sears Point, things have gone from bad to worse at Washington Irving Motorsports. The team's website is down and there's word the crew has been sent home without pay. Tony Roper quits and looks for a new team. It's heard he may still have support from Dr. Pepper as a sponsor, but that falls through as they sign with David Green at CC Welliver. Later that same week, Roper tests with Alumni Motorsports, a struggling single-car Bush team fielded by Ohio State alumnus Brent Bushu. The team doesn't go with Roper for the next race in Milwaukee and sticks with Lance Hooper. Meanwhile, Kyle Petty arranges with ASA driver Scott Hansen to qualify the number 45 at Milwaukee, while Petty runs the cup race in Daytona that coming Saturday. 
Kyle finishes 30th in this Daytona race, held on July 1st, which also marks the final cup race broadcast on CBS. That Pepsi 400 will become the 87th and final cup start for Kenny Irwin Jr. Irwin stays out to lead lap 86 under caution, the 179th lap he's led in a cup car. On lap 123, he makes this daring move down the backstretch. Yeah, pinching me every once in a while up here as they go five wide, six wide down the back straightaway. That's for about 13th that Jared moved into. He was 29th after he had his uh, tire problem, that long pit stop. Kenny Irwin, that green car, ran the whole back straightaway on the apron to gain position. Irwin finishes 22nd and sits 28th in points, exactly where he ranked at the end of his rookie season. It's been a frustrating year, but outwardly, Irwin has reason to smile. It seems like an extremely frustrating plans year. for him to stay in the number 42 in 2001, and he'll be driving a brand new car the next week at New Hampshire. He's also planning on marrying his girlfriend and is thinking of the right way to propose. I hope his new car runs better 2nd, than the one Kyle he has. Petty travels to Milwaukee, where Scott Hansen has qualified the number 45 car in 18th. Petty finishes 8th, the first top 10 finish of the year for the team. That same day, NASCAR officials looking into Adams' crash report no signs of mechanical failure. While crew chiefs still point to a stuck throttle, Mike Helton says there is no evidence of that. Regardless, Petty will not compete in the following week's cup race in Loudoun, and again hands the wheel to Steve Grissom. However, Richard Petty will make the trip to Loudoun as a goodwill gesture to track President Bob Bear. The King will be there in time for opening practice on Friday, July 7th. Programs printed for the event already call it the New England 300, but the summer of 2000 is the height of the dot-com bubble, and websites are eager to buy up naming rights to races. And so, after the mall.com 400 at Darlington, but before the goracing.com 500 at Bristol, the investment of a cosmetic surgery really? referral service means New Hampshire will host the thatlook.com 300. This is really what the races used to be called back then? Thank you. I've been very fortunate to have some great car owners through the years. Two, especially, uh, that are here tonight, um, which are my parents. Uh, they, they're the ones that had to sacrifice so much to get me to this point in my career. Thank you. I love you, Mom and Dad. And he said, I'd rather be doing this than anything else in the whole world. And if, this, if I die doing this, Mom, it's what I want to do. Right. And, uh, was the last time I talked to him, and you know, he said, I'll call you after qualification. Eleven twenty-three a.m. Just eight minutes into the first practice, and during his first timed lap, Kenny Irwin Jr. slams the turn three wall nearly head on. This time, the car ramps onto the driver's side, slides for nearly the entire distance of turns three and four, and rolls to a stop on its roof. Brett Bodine, who was following Irwin into the corner, calls And what blows my mind about all of these is that it's all happening during practice. Like, are practices that dangerous back then? Like, jeez. Like, I just, I just, I don't, I don't get it. One of the worst accidents. Or is it like a car seen. error? When track medical staff reach the scene, Irwin is unresponsive. There's blood on his uniform. He's pulled out in 10 minutes, rushed to the infield care center, then transported to Concord Hospital. At 2.14 p.m., the worst fears are realized. For the second time in 56 days, a driver has been killed at New Hampshire. And for the first time since Rodney Orr's practice crash at Daytona in 1994, it's a cup driver. Irwin was just 30 years old. Just like everyone else down here, as, as I stand here, Oof. it's just really hard for me to believe that less than two months after the Adam Petty tragedy, that once again the NASCAR racing family is forced to deal with another loss of life. And like Adam Petty, just like you said, Kenny Irwin was one of NASCAR's brightest young rising stars on their horizon. He had a lot of promise, there's no doubt about that. In his days in USAC, he won two Rookie of the Year titles there. Then he came to NASCAR and won two more in the Craftsman Truck Series and, like you said, in the NASCAR Winston Cup Series. It was obvious, evident, the amount of promise that that career held. Now, like you say, it will have to go unfulfilled. My thoughts and my prayers are with Kenny Irwin's friends and his family. We lost an extremely nice young man here on Friday. Here's Steve Burns. Thanks, Glenn. It's so hard to know what to say because nothing we can say will bring Kenny Irwin back. You know, just a moment ago, Eli Gold referred to Kenny Irwin as a racer. Folks, 
That's the ultimate term of respect in this sport. Not to be called Mr., but to be called a racer. And that's what Kenny Irwin was. He was also a stand-up guy. You know, when he got in that 28 car, he endured some criticism. He never ducked the media. He'd always answer a question, always yes, polite about doing true. From what I've seen, that's real true. Irwin was a racer, and he was also a stand-up guy, Ralph. Seemed like one. Whether he was putting the right rear of his midget in the cushion at Terre Haute or drafting at Daytona, Kenny Irwin was just that, Steve. He was a real racer, and he loved nothing more in this life than to do that, climb behind the wheel of a race car and give it everything he had. And he earned a great deal of admiration from his fellow competitors for that very reason. A lot of the drivers that you've talked to here this weekend, including names like Tony Stewart, will tell you he was the toughest competitor they ever faced. Some of the NASCAR Winston Cup drivers never got to see the full complement of what Kenny Irwin could do behind the wheel of a race car. Unfortunately, we won't have that chance. But for those of us who have seen Kenny behind the wheel doing what he did best, it truly was magical. Unfortunately, for now, the magic is gone. The cause of death is printed as a crushed skull, but is later clarified as a basilar skull fracture, the same as Adam Petty's. As with Petty, the cause of the accident remains unknown. Robert Fisk, Loudoun's police chief, says NASCAR contacted his department two hours after the crash, too late to do a proper investigation. So clearly we need to bump up the, the car safety. The starts just 30 minutes after the accident. They can't even determine whether Look the wreck the happened before or after Irwin started to turn. A stuck throttle is again believed to be the cause. As with Adam Petty, the number 42 team loads up and leaves the track. Sometime later, Felix Sabatas will have the car destroyed to deter souvenir hunters. The rest of the day's activities go on as scheduled. I just don't know what to say except it's just super tragic. It's horrible. It's, it, it's terrible. Uh, it, it's something I hope uh, none of my family or friends ever have to go through. Makes everything else kind of uh, not really seem to matter, you know. It's just very unfortunate. Uh, just glad to be able to say that uh, I knew him as a teammate, but more than anything else, uh, he was a friend, and uh, we've all lost a good friend. They, they need to do something. I mean, whatever it is, I mean, these modifieds got a, a kill switch on these things when, when something hangs up on them. Uh, you're just going too fast here in straightaways, and there's no, uh, your head can only take so much. So. Why can't we do something yeah. about this? Why can't we do something with the cars when these throttles hang, or if it was a throttle hung, it looks like... Why can't we do something about the racetrack? Why can't we do something? You know, this stuff happens for reasons. We need to learn from them. Just exactly. one day later in the Truck Series race, Dennis Setzer enters the third turn. For sixth place, Jimmy Hensley, number 16, and oh, it's Setzer, in trouble. hard oh. in the wall. He did oh not know if he locked the brakes or what happened, but boy, he did go hard in the ooh, wall. Oh, oh, oh. Bob there. That's right. Jack Sprague, number 24, on Six. fire there. Setzer walks away. Nine yeah, months earlier, Irwin was involved in this famous altercation with Tony Stewart, his old rival in USAC. After Irwin's death, it is Stewart who offers to fly Irwin's family and coach driver on his private jet. It is Stewart who wins the somber race on Sunday, which is shortened by 27 laps due to rain. And it is Stewart who then gives that trophy to Irwin's family. I raced with Kenny for nine years, and, and that was a nice know, gesture. Since I moved down to the three-quarter midgets and the full midgets, he was the guy I had to race hard each week. And if I wanted to win a race, he was the guy I had to beat each week. So, uh, you know, it, it's just one of those weird things. I mean, ever since we've moved into Winston Cup, I mean, every time I get a practice sheet, I, the first thing I do is look to see where he is and look to see where Bobby Labonte is. So, uh, it's just hard. I mean, it. He was a great racer. I mean, in the 21 years I've raced, there was nobody tougher than he was. I mean, it didn't matter whether it was a midget on dirt or a silver crown car or a sprint car on pavement. It didn't matter. He was he was a contender to win every week. And, uh, you know, I, I heard a quote yesterday. I don't that people thought that they hadn't seen the best of Kenny Irwin in a Winston Cup car. I agree. Teams can't wait to leave New Hampshire that rainy day, but they all reach a shared realization. They will all be back just two months later for another 300-mile race. Figuring out what has happened and what could or would be done becomes a new priority. Were these two accidents simply a tragic coincidence or was something else happening? You know, when you start now, before we end the video, I feel like they should like immediately when the first incident happened, they should have been on it trying to figure out what went wrong. Sadly, they didn't do that. And somebody else lost their life. It's just one of those things where like they should have acted on it fast and made the changes to avoid things like this. But 
hindsight is 2020. Um, I'm glad that now the safety is way better than what it was back then. But it's just it's just tragic. It's just tragic. I hope you guys enjoyed the reaction. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you in the next video. I love y'all. Peace. They wanna fall. Back when I was down bad, I was stuck in the mud. That nigga didn't clean up Louis V on the so so.